Welcome to WASC 64, the international conference organized by the World Academy of Art and Science, marking 64 years since our founding. I thank every one of you here for accepting our invitation and uh, joining us today. The Academy has been working on strategies to address global challenges for decades. But the last three, four years have presented uh, new challenges and unexpected consequences that compel us to reflect on the state of the world and its direction and review and reconsider the course that uh, we should take. So we launched a strategic planning process last year at the Academy. All our fellows were surveyed to find out uh, what is important, what needs to be addressed. And after studying the, the survey results, the WAS Board of Trustees met for three days at a strategic planning process session in Athens in November 23 to address these issues and, and, and reflect on our course. That was when we began making plans for this conference. And uh, we again surveyed our membership to find out uh, what issues will be most relevant for us to discuss today. I thank everyone who responded to our, our surveys and invitations this conference with its 24 sessions involving 110 speakers is a reflection of this process. Uh, before I hand over to our moderator, Fran Griffiths, I, I would like to go over a few technical details. This conference has been organized over four days in May and June in two parallel streams. We will be using two links throughout this conference, one for all the plenary and uh, A stream sessions, and another for the B stream. The agenda is available on the WAS website and, and please use Zoom a Q and A and chat features to post questions and add comments. We also welcome specific proposals for future WAS programming and uh, invite you to mail us your proposals to WAS support so that the board can take it further. All the sessions in this conference are being live streamed on YouTube they are being recorded. And these recordings will be available on the WASC website. And all of this information will be shared again with you in the chat window. Part of the, the, the last day of these uh, four days of the conference, June 27th, will be devoted to a general assembly of WASC fellows to draw conclusions and uh, make plans. In Athens last year, we charted out a vision for the future. This conference will explore the themes that will serve as a basis for our future programming. During the General Assembly on June 27th, we will make a plan of action for the Academy. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Fran Griffiths, who will moderate our inaugural session. Fran is a culture change leadership team and talent management expert. She facilitated our strategic planning process sessions in November and has been working with our trustees on these issues that are about to be discussed now and over the four days of the conference. Thank you for being with us here today, Fran, and over to you. Thank you very much, Janie, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here this afternoon, at least my time. Um, so I'd like to start off by introducing our panelists, and I'm delighted to do that. And I'm going to introduce them in the order that they will also be, also be speaking. So I'd like to start with Maria Espinoza. She uh, was the former president of the 73rd session of the UN General Assembly. And I might add only the fourth woman to hold that position in the history of the UN. Uh, Gustavo Marino is our second panellist. He is just the newly appointed director for MOST, which is the UNESCO programme for the management of social transformation and foresight. Uh, Gary Jacobs, who needs no introduction, of course, the president of WAS. And finally, Katan Patel, who is chair of the Force for Good. Thank you all very much for being here today. So I'm going to start with Maria, but before we do that, let me just remind ourselves of the questions that we'd like you to cover. There are three of them. The first one is about what are what's your view of the biggest and most important unanswered questions that humanity faces today? Secondly, given those big unanswered questions, what are the fundamental issues that must be addressed so that we can come up with the right solutions? And finally, what role do you think organizations such as WAS and others can have in addressing those issues? 
And we're going to ask you to do that, please, in roughly seven minutes. So I know that's no small challenge, but very interested to hear your views. And Maria, I'd like to pass straight to you, if I may. Well, thank you. Thank you, Fran. And, and we will keep uh, the questions uh, in mind. And let me play uh, first, uh, take the opportunity to say hello to, to the WAS family, uh, especially to Gary, of course, uh, and, um, and remind ourselves that, uh, yes, the, this is the 64th conference of the World Academy of uh, Art and Science, and that um, this is uh, the 64th anniversary. And when the Academy was created, uh, you know, it was uh, created by eminent intellectuals such as uh, Albert Einstein, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, uh, Bertrand Roussel, etc. So the first uh, reflection is that if we were to create the World Academy today, we would have more women thinkers and intellectuals uh, and perhaps more people for countries uh, from uh, the global south. And I think this is because the world has changed a lot, uh, just as the challenges we face today have changed uh, since uh, the Academy was founded. And today, I think that we would all agree that we stand at a very critical juncture in global affairs, facing unprecedented challenges. We have indeed witnessed remarkable advancements uh, from medicine to science, uh, healthcare, agriculture, education, and digital inclusion. Our advancements have resulted in a human family that now numbers uh, more than 8 billion people. And yet, uh, despite of this progress, uh, we face overlapping and escalating crises, you know, from the triple planetary crisis of climate extinction and, and pollution to historical levels of mass displacement. So uh, in, in we see, you know, from war to looming inequalities, and these are really threatening everyone everywhere, but of course, hitting the hardest, the already disenfranchised, the excluded, the poor. And currently, when, when I have to say this number, it really hurts. But today, uh, we have 712 million people living in extreme poverty worldwide. So the panel on, on, on climate change has already said that we are in a trajectory of uh, going above 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2030. And we know that this is, uh, a, you know, devastating disaster uh, for um, the livelihoods and the well-being of, 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 of people, but also calls for an immediate climate action. We also know that around 3.6 billion people live in vulnerable zones to climate change effects. And, and this, of course, uh, you know, uh, on top of uh, growing migration flows uh, around the world. So, at, in uh, you know, by 2050, uh, we know that we will be perhaps at 10 billion, according to uh, the uh, studies of, of, of the UN, uh, 10 billion people. And which means that uh, this will require massive investment in sustainable development, uh, services, jobs, social protection, infrastructure, resource management, etc. So the the impacts and symptoms of this compounded crisis are, you know, as we have seen and witnessed, you know, weakened economies, uh, conflict, food, energy, and water shortages, um, and this in turn, of course, uh, lead to a profound. Uh, in in I would like to focus on these a profound disenchantment with existing institutions, including the United Nations. And this crisis, you will agree with me, are all human-made crises. And therefore, the solutions, uh, the responses uh, have to be human-made and um, you know, bring in collective action. So a key issue is how we can adapt our institutions and systems to foster resilience and inclusivity in the face of these global challenges that I just mentioned. So we need a, a well-functioning international system based on the very foundational uh, concepts of, of, of the UN uh, almost 80 years ago, cooperation and solidarity. Um, and a UN that delivers, uh, that is well-equipped 
to respond to all the new challenges uh, is is therefore essential and perhaps uh, more needed than than ever because we know we know that no state nor nor or actor alone can face uh, the current and future challenges so effective solutions will only emerge from a deep understanding of these issues uh, combined with innovate innovative thinking and collaborative action i think that uh, we may say that reform has practically been a perennial item on the UN agenda since its, its establishment in 1945. Uh, but of course, as, as a living organization, as a human-made organization, it is natural uh, to adjust, uh, to remain relevant and effective in the changing times, of course. So uh, our multilateral, since the question was about institutions, our multilateral global governance system has achieved a lot in 78 years uh, of, of history, but uh, you know, has to deliver uh, and to be relevant and to remain relevant uh, in the midst of a changing, uh, dynamically and, and, and fastly changing world. Um, so I think that, um, the organization itself, uh, the, the whole multilateral architecture, including going beyond the UN, should learn resilience, adaptation, and transformation, and, and do that at the same time. So what uh, I'm saying at the end is that the UN is a human-made organization with ample room for improvement. And at this point, though, the adjustment curve needs to be steeper with the world facing, as I mentioned at the beginning, a perfect storm of interconnected mega crises, notably, well, war, climate, food, energy, et cetera, along with uh, this very shifting volatile geopolitics uh, in uh, what I would say a real, a tangible multipolar world order, the organization really needs to be, you know, rejuvenated and retooled. Um, and how is that uh, the system and the global governance designs that we have come up with um, are inclusive, effective, et cetera, and um, for the world of today and, and, and tomorrow. Let me just say, take one minute to mention the opportunity of the, of the summit of the future uh, and uh, the uh, opportunity also to have a, a set of decisions, the Pact for the Future, the Declaration of Future Generations, and the Global Digital Compact, uh, which we hope will be bold, action-oriented, and, and connect with each other. I think this is you know, a, a major opportunity and a key challenge. And just to close, allow me you know, to share three ideas, more like three keywords. Uh, the first key word is complexity. I think we should not shy away from complexity. Instead, we need to develop the epistemological, the policy and political tools to address this interconnectedness and interdependence with the right policy and political tools. Uh, in other words, we need uh, systems thinking. Uh, the the, the uh, I think that... Um, uh, Janani mentioned uh, what would be the things to do for the World Academy, you know, to put, uh, you know, emphasis on systems thinking. The, the second uh, word is subsidiarity. Power, decision making and leadership should happen at all levels of government, from the family to the community, to the city, to the nation. Uh, to the multilateral space. So we cannot not leave the responsibility solely in the hands of governments, but citizens, uh, workers' unions, the private sector. The third uh, key word is prevention and precaution. And, and here, I think that we seem to constantly react to crises, uh, trying to do damage control when they already happen, be it war or a pandemic. So I think that we need to, to develop more analytics, better perspective, um, uh, prospective thinking and better forensics, not to repeat the mistakes of the past. This is the part of the role of, of the UN in the, uh, and the academic community. This can be translated into something that I think is critical, especially as we think uh, about the future of the UN, which is preventive diplomacy, early warning systems, trust building in our multilateral world. 
Uh, this is something that the UN should put a lot more emphasis on, and perhaps this is where we have failed the most. And fourth and last, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the need to go back to our human nature and self-preservation. For some reason, and believe me, I don't have the answer, it seems like our capacity to destroy, even if it means destroying our own livelihoods and futures, um, is stronger, is more potent than our capacity to restore, rebuild, and mend. And here I believe the concept of human security is a valuable tool. We, we must recast our efforts to ensure that all humans live in peace, free from fear and free from, from want. And our multilateral systems should be built, rebuilt and retooled, placing human security at the center. So uh, just the last word, would say, I would say institutions matter, the UN matters. It is the platform, the global space to reach agreement and to process dissent. It is the, the kitchen of international law and, and the guiding protocols of our human coexistence. It is the space for preventive diplomacy and bold action. So uh, I hope that uh, the days to come in this conference will be a space to reflect uh, on these uh, four uh, key words uh, that I have shared with you. I wish you really a very fruitful, uh, productive 60, 64th WAS conference. And um, over to you, uh, Madam Moderator, looking forward to listening uh, to my uh, panel colleagues. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you for starting. Um, thank you. Gustavo, may I please go to you? Sure. Thank you very much uh, to us for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, was and the UNESCO have a long-standing relationship, and I'm glad that we continue to do so. And now, regarding the question, uh, you know, the, the French philosopher Edgar Morin uh, came to UNESCO last time in 2021 to celebrate his 100 years, and he introduced the concept of the poly crisis, uh, which I believe effectively encapsulates the the several crises, interconnected crises, which I've experienced since 2020. Uh, and uh, indeed, we are at the crossroads uh, facing an array of global challenges, such as climate change, economic inequality, political instability, technological disruption, health issues, and they interact with each other. I mean, we could see, for instance, um, migration has always been present, very often a uh, uh, result of uh, people looking for better livelihoods, economic opportunities very often escaping from conflict. But now we also have all the migra migration related to climate change and the problems uh, stemming from climate change, like natural, dis natural disasters and so on. So all these are combined in a way uh, that we probably had not so much before. And um, so this requires uh, using concrete evidence, analysis, and the urgent need of concrete action. And uh, of course, there's no, no, we don't only have crisis, we have also many opportunities. Uh, uh, for example, the accelerated technological, technological change, and Maria Fernanda Espinosa talked a bit about that, uh, provides uh, clearly opportunities. It can be a way for development, but also challenges in itself. You know, there's a big inequalities being created, uh, or the use of, for instance, um, for the use of artificial intelligence in non-ethical ways, that's a risk. Uh, that's why, for example, UNESCO promoted uh, and, uh, and the recommendation on the ethics of AI, which was endorsed by over 190 countries. And uh, the point is that, you know, we have this poly crisis, for instance, we just had the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, left us feeling uh, fragile and uncertain, and is a stark reminder of vulnerabilities. Uh, for instance, uh, again, to see how everything is interconnected. The world uh, had been reducing extreme poverty for three decades. The tendency was very clear. I mean, there could have been changes within countries, but in general, the world uh, tendency in extreme poverty had been falling. And just because of COVID and the surrounding crisis around it, uh, for the first time, we had a, a, a reversal of that downward trend in poverty. Uh, to the extent that we can face this crisis in an intelligent way and, and avoid and look at it, not just in this case, for example, not just the health aspect of COVID, but also the economic impact, uh, how it affects families, we can uh, face the challenge in a much better way. Uh, another point is that the economic 
narrative is crucial. Uh, and what gets measured gets done. And here talking about uh, how we measure progress and how we see progress. And there's a lot of emphasis that has been put, for instance, on, on the GDP as a measure. But we all know, I mean, GDP can be a useful measure, but doesn't take into account, for instance, the, the impact on the environment, uh, issues of inequality, issues of distributional aspects between, between groups. And uh, because what is measured gets done, uh, this leads to practices that are, in the end, harmful for, for us and harmful for the planet. Uh, so we need to rethink uh, how we do these measurements. No? Um, and this, you know, the in the way we advance in this way can also lead to being more effective in combating other challenges like climate change. Now, uh, uh, another point I wanted to make is the related to science. Uh, Science thrives in an open say, and safe ecosystem that encourages the generation and free flow of ideas. Yet, uh, there is a worrying trend. There's data that shows that, for example, trust in science is uh, falling very often gets or gets undermined uh, for many reasons, fake news, uh, uh, the use of social media, not... Uh, informing adequately uh, the, 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 the results of scientific research, the lack of evidence-based policies, evidence based on, on science. Um, it's, it's, uh, that's also obviously contributing to exacerbating the challenges rather than resolving them. Uh, for instance, one issue that I want to address in this regard is the safety of scientific researchers, which is often challenged. Uh, and this puts science under pressure. Uh, so, you know, scientists can be at risk from, from we find the data, for example, uh, that, that uh, almost 40% of scientists around the world working on climate topics experience online harassment related to their research, according to Global Witness, or uh, one in two women scientists say they have experienced sexual harassment at work, uh, but also sometimes uh, harm um, harm to scientists uh, or to safety of scientists comes uh, from different groups, from public opinion, or even from the governments themselves through so different ways. So, so we have to work on, on addressing safety of sciences as well to be able to address these challenges better. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much, Gustavo. May I now hand to Gary, please? Thank you, Fran, Janani, Maria, Gustavo, Caitlin for joining us for this launch event. Uh, and uh, thank you particularly to Maria and Gustavo for uh, what we have just heard, because I think these are really the critical types of issues that we should be addressing during the three, the four days of the uh, General Assembly. And I'd like to go back to uh, uh, the reference that Maria made to uh, our tendency for destruction as well as creation and Gustavo's reference to what, he, what is often called the polycrisis. And I think the question that I'd like to ask and comment on a little is why at this time do we see, we had enough on the agenda in 2015 when the, when the SDGs were uh, drawn up and we thought it was an, object, uh, uh, an ambitious sufficient target and then suddenly one third of the way through the initiative to 2030 we've kind of run into more than a wall i'd say something that was really unanticipated for all but the those with the uh, uh, second sight uh, a, a series of rising series of obstacles uh, starting of course with covid and then with the uh, russia uh, uh, war in ukraine uh, and uh, now, of course, Palestine and climate change, at which we can claim, uh, didn't come as a surprise uh, because uh, we've known about it for a long time. But still, the, the increasing seriousness of it and our incapacity to deal with it. And finally, most recently, of course, is the sudden emergence of AI, both as an unprecedented opportunity and an unprecedented change 
reminiscent for those of us who know the history of the academy to the type of challenge that, uh, that our founders faced in dealing with the unleashing of the nuclear genie in which a number of them were actively involved but never anticipated uh, that in doing so they were going to be uh, creating a problem that persists after 75 years uh, uh, which had hoped to solve problems or be a, a, an engine for support. So I'd, I'd like to ask the question, why at this time of unprecedented economic capacity for production, unprecedented technological innovation and dissemination, higher rates of education, greater cooperation and interchange between people around the world. I mean, in many respects, some of them were mentioned, but in, in many respects, the, world, uh, the, the attention to the, the human rights of minorities, to the protection of women and, uh, and others. In many respects, this is a period of unprecedented accomplishment uh, in the history of the last 75 years. And yet why we suddenly have to be meeting something that appears to be a change of course. And for many people, there is a concern, are we going backwards? <laughs> we seem to be gaining progress. We may not be going as fast as we wanted to, but it almost looks like we're going backwards in the other direction. And how do we explain that to ourselves? And I'd just like to make a, a few comments. We actually have a session on this uh, tomorrow is the last session in the afternoon, but I'd like to, for thinking during the, the conference about uh, one comment I would make is that the speed of change is absolutely unprecedented in history. The speed of social and cultural and technological and economic change, the movement of people, and uh, perhaps the capacity of the human race. It used to be that we were adjusting to change over centuries or uh, then over 50 years. The technology introduced uh, used to happen one in a decade or something like that. But now we're facing such enormous speed of chain that it requires us to adjust. And it puts a tremendous stress on humanity. The, the youth today who are entering into the, uh, their education are wondering what I study today, will it be valid when I finish <laughs> uh, uh, the school or the university? Uh, and what will it mean in five years from now when the latest generation of technologies comes about. I think, so this is one way to think about it. Our institutions typically grow much more slowly than our capacity, than the, than the need for change in these days. It used to be institutions changed over centuries. <laughs> Feudalism was around for a long time. Monarchy was around for a long time. Colonial error at least ran for a few centuries. And now we're seeing the changes so quickly, our institutions, as well as our culture, as well as our personal, uh, are finding it more and more difficult to adapt and adapt quickly. And I'm stressing that because I think in our work, uh, uh, there's always a tendency to look at who can we blame for the sudden reversal? Who has broken the momentum? But I think it's something more fundamental than that. I think generally the level of insecurity and anxiety and uncertainty in the world is greater than perhaps it's been in 75 years, in spite of the fact that in many respects, in many measures, we're better off than we have been uh, in 75 years. And that uncertainty, that sense of insecurity leads people to act differently. They act for fear of protecting what they have, of losing what they have. They become more defensive. They, op they close the sense of open our borders and, uh, and open our hearts and, uh, and let's cooperate. Even the, the cooperation between the West and China, which was a fantastic driver of development in the previous decades, suddenly it's, it looks as a threat. The expansion of Europe, which I think is the greatest accomplishment of humanity in the sense of uh, nation states living together harmoniously, but is perceived as a threat to those who are not part of that and have not been included in the, the, the security system. We don't have a global cooperative security system that takes care of the needs of everybody. And now we have the nuclear genie coming back. 
it looks in one respect like we have a lot of unfinished business. Finished business on which we made progress in 1990-91, but we left it undone. We, we went ahead in many things like the internet, WTO, EU and everything, but we just pushed things under the carpet and now they're surfacing again and showing us the work that we hadn't completed, that we need to complete if we're really to take this to the next, the next launching pad. Uh, and I think, Fran, I get the feeling that I'm uh, running out of time, so I will respect that. I just end by saying, uh, I think as we go through all these very interesting sessions, and I thank everybody who's contributed the ideas and will be contributing to the, the sessions themselves, let's think about how our present institutions, how suitable they are to support us in this time of extraordinary change, how rapidly we have to change them. And I'm very happy that uh, Gustavo is here and UNESCO is represented, and he represents most, uh, which is, the management of uh, social transformation. And I think it's the closest concept in the whole UN system to what we need now, I think. We need to learn how to manage the global social transformation, something that's never been done consciously before, certainly not on the scale it is now. And it's a high priority for us at the Academy. Thank you. Gary, Katan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was um, inspiring, actually, to hear Maria, you articulate for us all the, the depth of the challenges we face and the breadth of them and uh, how complex it is, the world that we live in. Gustavo, you too, in terms of highlighting just this need for social transformation with your presence, but also with your words. And Gary, um, this is a great follow on for our strategy event in Athens, which I thought was dynamic and lively and enormously productive. Uh, to answer the three questions that we're here to do, I mean, firstly, I would say it's clear we're not in normal times. This is a time where the confluence of so many huge changes are, are hitting us all at once. And today's military and political conflicts, I think, remind us that we as a, we as a species are still not capable of raising uh, or resolving our differences with compassion and sharing. We, we insist on killing each other to resolve our differences. Um, at the same time, of course, we have those challenges of climate change and geopolitical rivalry and so on. Uh, but we're also planning to add 50% more people to the planet um, in the first half of this century. Uh, and if you take all that together, it's clear we're in the midst, especially with the technological change of a shift in civilizations. And we have nearly exhausted what the planet can do for us and damaged it potentially to a point where repair will be very difficult. The model that has put us today in a position of great prosperity for at least a third of the world, um, the average numbers tell us that we've raised the whole world to a level we've never been before, but there's been disproportionate value to the north and the west of the world, the one third of the planet's population. Um, that model of that industrial model of production, consumption, wealth creation um, is no longer of great value to us. Um, and although it's been great for the last 200 years, it, it is now something that actually can only lead to more destruction in the world. And that way of thinking too, that power model of thinking is dangerous. But every defining factor of the industrial era is already in decline. Fossil fuels as an energy source is in decline as a percentage of the whole. Physical labor for generating income where individuals are just thought of as production units. The West as the arbiter of value and values is also something that is in decline. And something else is replacing it. Renewables as the energy source, digital media, AI, as ways of creating income. Um, the US, the EU, China, and India as future scaled arbiters of power and of wealth creation. So we're in a systemic shift that redefines almost everything from our own mental health and our relationships with each other um, and with our communities, whether we're cohesive or divisive, uh, are all being redefined right now. And I think this is why it's so uncomfortable and so perilous actually for us. The UN has called for a change in the UN system itself and for multilateral institutions across the world to address these issues. The governance system itself, they recognize is not working, cannot stop wars, cannot lead people to diplomacy, 
cannot lead to climate change or the unlocking of capital to, to fill the gap. Our work at Force for Good, partnering with the World Academy of Art and Science, um, ha has shown that actually, although the general mood is the SDGs are not achievable and we will fail, and that may actually happen, it's not through lack of solutions. We identified 15 solutions around which capital can mobilize and 10 technology-based solutions that can be rolled out where no new inventions are required, which would allow us to more than 100% close this gap, the SDG gap. So it isn't because we don't have the solutions. It's not because we don't have the money. It is because we are not mobilizing to scale across the world to solve these issues. Stepping back, I think I completely agree with um, where Maria began and um, Gary just took us. Um, WAS is an institution founded by people who saw the possibilities, the risks and the opportunity of science and technology. And they feared that we would, we would do the wrong things and we would end up damaging the planet. Um, and we would not engender peace in the world. I think it's time for the World Academy of Art and Science to step up even further and play its role in the world as an institution that brings peace and brings solutions to the world. And this is exactly what the strategy is designed to do and what the heritage of the institution says we must do. Um, the one thing that can make the biggest difference, I think, is if we can foster a higher consciousness awareness in individuals. Our problems are not of science, technology, intellect, necessarily. Our problems are it's over small differences of opinion and small differences of view, we're prepared to kill each other in large numbers with the best weaponry we can make. So if we continue to do that, if we value the power over the principles, um, then we will not succeed. And I think WAS has an important role to play in this bringing together of science and the humanities and so I hope um, this particular General Assembly and the discussions that will happen will be fascinating and we will press each other hard to see if we can push to solutions. Thank you very much. Can we go back to Maria, please? Any thoughts? Well, I, I think that uh, it's, um, I think, encouraging that uh, we find so many you know, issues uh, that we understand in the same way, we worry in the same way, uh, but also that we see what potential outlets or potential solutions. And, and I think that um, going back uh, to the initial question, what does, you know, the role of uh, the World Academy of Arts and Sciences and in, in I would say that uh, uh, WAS has a, a, a very critical role to play. You know, the this interconnected nature of global risks, I think that it cries for more collaboration and more solidarity, but it also, you know, cries for a, a, this systems thinking, this uh, bringing complexity into the way we understand and we explain uh, the world and um, I, I see was uh, have uh, you know acting as a laboratory for innovation, uh, for cross disciplinary dialogue, uh, for promoting ethical leadership, um, and supporting transformative research and knowledge generation. And uh, when I when I mention the the need for cross fertilizing among epistemologies. I, I, I really mean this because uh, when I'm asked, uh, you know, what university I went to and what degrees and all of that, I all I often say, and I really mean it, that my my top university was five years living with indigenous peoples in the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, and and believe me, uh, if someone knows about complexity, about um um a reconciliation uh, with uh, with nature uh, and uh, uh, if someone knows about resilience and respecting planetary boundaries is 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 them and and i think that uh, this need to bring different epistemologies together to learn from indigenous knowledge uh, to understand you know how important it has been 
for the integrity of our planet. Uh, there are thousands of years of 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 uh, of lived experience on on to better know uh, the the environment. Um, also, strong lessons about uh, you know what overconsumption means. I think Ketan was mentioning uh, mentioning that. So the, there is a, a lot that we we uh, need to learn from the non-Western, you know, Cartesian uh, epistemologies. And perhaps you know this is one of the keys of of uh, when we are looking for for solutions. And um, I said uh, promoting ethical leadership in transformative uh, uh, research, I think it's part of, of, of the role of, uh, of the, the academy. And, and of course, knowledge itself doesn't solve the problem. It's to transform knowledge into policy and uh, creating platforms of knowledge exchange, of supporting emerging leaders advocating for policies that uh, promote uh, sustainability and, and social justice. I, I mentioned these four uh, keywords and, and I think that uh, they are indeed important. We cannot think of a um, rejuvenated United Nations if we don't understand that, uh, you know, the complexity of the world we live in uh, today. And um, the issue of uh, the role of local governments, the role of citizens, the principle of subsidiarity, uh, the need to really put at the forefront a, um, the issue of, and that we have forgotten, you know, of, of preventive diplomacy, of, of uh, being one step ahead, of, of being prospective rather than, than, than reactive. And I think that we are leaving the consequences of not being properly prepared or not, you know, having these forward thinking kind of um, analytics that would allow us to take the right decisions at the right time. And, um, and, and also to emphasize something that Gary, Ketan and, and, and Gustavo mentioned, that at the end, um, all of these uh, institutions, these very complex governance designs that we have come up with, um, have to have, you know, the human at the center, uh, our human security uh, at the center, uh, you know, the sense of self-preservation. And uh, when when Gary was saying, I mean, we live a world of of paradox of, of, you know, we know better, we know more, we have the science, we have the technology, we have everything we need to fix these problems, yes, yet we are unable. We are meeting at the end of this year 29 times in conferences of the parties and the emissions continue to grow. What is that we're not doing right? And, and the truth yeah. is, just to close, the, the, the truth is that um, a, there is an issue of uh, a, of uh, of our the, the our civilization. I mean, we are living a, a crisis of civilization where where greed and in in power and you know and privilege uh, and concentration of wealth are you know the guiding forces. Uh, so at the end, it's a it's a value crisis. Uh, and when we think how to reshape our multilateral system, I would say we need a value-based uh, multilateral system and a value-based um, global order looking at our commons, at, at the, you know, our global public goods and how to share them fairly and how to ensure that the eight plus billion people living in this planet, more than half of them being women and girls, you know, live with dignity. It's not too much to ask. And, and again, I think that this approach of the human security, you know, of, yeah, of the approach of human security can uh, and, and perhaps should be used as, as the center, you know, to re rebuild and rethink the overall multilateral system. So of course, easy to say, difficult to do, but I think that these are many, many challenges and looking forward to listening to the incredible cohort of speakers that we're going to have in the coming days. Thank you so much, Maria. Gustavo, any, any thoughts from you for a couple of minutes? Uh, yes, uh, just briefly, and I thank Gary for, for talking, referring to the management of social transformations for most program. 
uh, and that indeed aligns very closely uh, the work of UNESCO and uh, WAS. And uh, the most problem basically tries to bridge the gap between the, uh, the build, build on the science policy nexus, uh, leading you know, from what we know to how we can act to improve and face the challenge we, we have. And that in, implies not just the uh, natural sciences, but the social sciences, and to do so in an interdisciplinary way. Um, uh, for instance, from the social sciences, uh, usually for policy, very economics, and I'm an economist, is the, <laughs> the key, but we have to understand from philosophy, from the arts, uh, uh, from sociology, from you know, understand the futures and foresight methodologies, plus all additional natural sciences. And this requires, uh, it's important to transform this, the science ecosystem. And UNESCO's 2017 recommendation on science and scientific research is those precisely, seeks to precisely do that, providing a vision of science that goes beyond growth, the productivity, and emphasizes well being, human well being, and inclusion. And it looks, for example, at 10 key areas empowering women and girls to follow a career in science, making scientific applications accessible to all. Uh, providing conditions for scientists to work in freedom and safety, favoring trust in, in scientific culture and society, ensuring science-led policymaker. So this is, we really have to build on that. Um, and uh, not only to find new ways to deal with the challenges, but to find ways that uh, lead to scientific progress being focused on uh, well-being, human well-being and the, looking at the earth as well, of course. And uh, with that, I finish just thanking you all again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Gustavo. So, so Gary, I'm now going to pass to you for final, final closing thoughts and to close this session. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks to uh, Maria and, and Gustavo and also Caitlin uh, for highlighting such really important points for us. And Maria, you saved me. Uh, <laughs> emphasize what we've been doing for the last one and a half years on the on the uh, issue of human security, because we're convinced that we've made that the centerpiece of our strategic plan, because that that's the foundation on which we can hope for a more stable, productive world. If people are feeling increasingly insecure, we're not we're going to get more polarization, more friction, more violence, more defensiveness, uh, and where we need just the opposite. And therefore, this idea that it, it's not just governments, it's not just national policies of governments competing with each other or cooperating, it's how do we raise that basic fundamental level of, hum of security among people all over the world. Uh, and that's a key priority for us. I'd just like to highlight something that Caitlin said. Uh, he didn't have time to elaborate, but he will be running a session on this. The work that uh, his group at Force for Good have been doing on innovative strategies. I don't know if there's anybody else who's really saying the SDGs can really be completed by 2030, but that's what he said and that's what he means. And they've done a lot of analysis. It's not wishful thinking. And he's been speaking to high level people in the UN and other places who say they agree with him. <laughs> Uh, and they're glad that somebody has recognized those levers, what we call catalytic strategies that can make it possible. So in spite of the tensions and everything, we're very upbeat on the scope to really do something. I'm really happy that Gustavo elaborated uh, very briefly on most because it's addressing such critical issues. In fact, the philosophy behind most permeates everything we're doing at the academy because it's not just we see the problems we face are not just physical, objective, quantifiable issues that can be handled by science uh, and all. It's depending on human beings. It's the psychology, the values, the aspirations of human beings, the kind of knowledge, the subjective knowledge that comes from the humanities, uh, that comes from the arts, the human values that we put into this physical world and everything we do in the academy, we're trying to bridge this gap. And we have very interesting session on this uh, coming up. And my final uh, comment, because we are at the end of our session, is so important for this is education. And I'd, just to make a pretty radical statement, I'd say the education we need is decades behind what we need. 
and I'm not blaming anybody for that because education has always been oriented to the past and collecting what happened in the past and, and studying it, whereas we need an education that anticipates the future. And that's what our youth need. That's what the future uh, of humanity needs. And that puts an enormous challenge on educational institutions and on the world as a whole to find a new and a better way to deliver knowledge and preparation for the future. And that's also a very high priority for the academy. Fortunately, things are beginning to happen now, just beginning to show the emerging technology makes it possible for us to break out of these, uh, of the, the monopoly of certain institutions on knowledge transfer and on preparing, preparing the next generations. Uh, ideas have been floated now. We have new models like the Khan Academy, uh, which is trying to deliver a system, including building AI right into it. The WAS itself is looking to build a Greenfields uh, example of a, a higher educational system that marries business, technology, and society, uh, all and the individual uh, leadership into one thing. We need new models like this. There are things happening, but not nearly fast enough. And we'll be trying to work in our strategic plan to see how we can help and work with other partners to accelerate it. Thank you again very much.